it's gonna be fun. Right, guys, this week we're gonna talk about the T-spine and just some things to consider in your training, kind of the basic function and anatomy. Uh, Jeremy's gonna take us through some of the more sophisticated sides of the interactions with the nervous system um, and how that can kind of be the root problem for things like systemic, uh, you know, hand and arm pain or neuropathy. Um, and then just kind of, again, talking about things that you should consider based on your posture, your ability to move in the thoracic spine with your training. So with that, Jeremy, you want to take it off with a little anatomy 101 here? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> I'm not really like an anatomy book, but um, yeah, it's like thoracic spine. I mean, if we're talking like 3D motion of the actual spine, um, it's pretty significant and super important. So I mean, I think the only, I mean, to preface everything, my whole vision or um, philosophy with the whole like back and spine, um, I'm super into like Sue Falsoni's work with the spine. You guys know that heavily. Um, but I think the most important thing is with the thoracic spine, it's like the, um, the way the facet joints are kind of located. Um, so with like a thoracic spine, um, how the facet joints are, they're placed more kind of, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, like more in a frontal plane kind of thing. So it's an extremely like, um, it's well made for like side bending, um, a lot of rotation stuff. Uh, so if we're not unlocking like the structure and like the function of what it's supposed to do, then I mean, we're already kind of like looking for potential injuries in the future. For sure. So when I think about the T-spine, the first thing that comes to mind for me is contrasting action or contrasting pattern. Um, I think it gets a little bit misconstrued as uh, just kind of inherently needing a mobility demand and we ignore the stability component that's involved there. And then the third thing is, I feel like we are like fearful of flexion and extension, especially under load. Yeah. Saying so. Uh, let's take two basic examples. Somebody who has that kyphotic or like shoulders rounded forward type of posture and then, uh, or, you know, the rounded upper back in layman's terms. And then the opposition being the flat T-spine or the flat mid-back region. What are some, you know, kind of basic considerations on that? Um, basic considerations, just, I would say like even... I guess through experience, even if it was extremely rounded, like extremely kyphotic or even like super flat, I feel like simply just assessing, again, T-spine rotation, it's not a sexy answer, but um, I feel like sometimes like it could be a facet issue where the facets aren't really like talking to each other kind of thing, or even if it's like a flat back, um, maybe see what the ribs are doing, like when they're articulating with those um, uh, ver uh, thoracic vertebrae, you know what I mean? So every, when, when you, when I think of a spine, you have to think of like all the junctions because it's, right. you know, how many movable parts connected to that kind of scaffolding. So when one thing's like kind of off just a little bit and then there goes the whole cascade and then with the spine too, I mean, like, you know, you're kind of, kind of screwed sometimes when you're not addressing those like nuances for sure and that's something you see a lot oh yeah flexion extension flexion extension um and uh things that we often notice if there's an issue in flexion or extension then a lot of times there's a bit of a rotational issue as well um we just happen to focus more on flexion and extension because of the um, that's how we need the T-spine to be able to move and stabilize as well in the Olympic lifts. The T-spine right. is a big, um, big factor when it comes to finding the position of the front rank for the clean and being able to stabilize in the overhead position of the snatch. So, the, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is a good example where, you know, thoracic flexion isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. Right, but we kind of fear monger about it. So, the there's there's a there's a spectrum too, right? So there's down on the ground doing like cat camels at the mm -hmm. thoracic region, you know, working thoracic flexion, and then there's thoracic flexion involved with a heavy front squat or a heavy you know uh, catch on a clean or something. Yeah. So 
I think that you, again, just simply look to the sport or look to the demands of whatever the endeavor is, you know, yeah. um, for my, my world, for instance, is a great example. Our world is a great example of this. Where yeah. <laughs> Not only are they going to be under a high presence of kyphosis or that rounded back posture, but it's going to be heavily reinforced because they're weighted down at the chest with, you know, anywhere from 20 to 45 pounds. And then on top of that, they have the forward head posture with headgear and kit on, or I'm sorry, with nogs on yeah. that are then, you know, extending that lever, so to speak. So going back to your point on it being such, you know, a, a critical junction here, this is a situation where you're going to have damage or, or, you know, ex exerting too much stress on the cervical disc, but there's going to be an, almost an inherent subsequent thoracic issue that's going to kind of interrelate there. Right. And again, like when you're assessing a joint, you know how we always say like check above and below, right. well then above is your neck, below is your lumbar spine. And if that middle part, if we're talking about like a weak link here, if that's weak, then it's definitely going to domino like up and down. So it's like, if we're not addressing like at least strength in your thoracic spine, I mean, that can cause on the top end, those cross syndromes where like one part's weak and then, you know, and then on the bottom end, it's like thinking of like that thoracolumbar like junction where they meet, that's going to be, could possibly be extremely like um, overextended because you don't have that motion in your T-spine. And then that's when you have like those super like extremely large paraspinals on your uh, low back. And then you have those like flat flush like backs with no muscle because like it's all super you know like weak not moving all those kind of words you know <laughs> all those words yeah <laughs> i don't know many words so <laughs> um yeah no that's a great point and again it's uh you know to kind of double back on olympic weightlifting again it this is where i probably go against the grain a little bit or i would say we go against the grain a little bit in saying yeah because it's only flexion extension dominant in Olympic weightlifting or a sport like that, then you should really only consider training flexion and extension in training because why wouldn't you, right? right. But I disagree. I think that there needs to be a complementary balance to again, kind of balance the system. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about the T-spine, we're always talking about the scapula, the rib cage, and again, mm -hmm you know, those vertebra above and below. So to bring that to a point with, when you feel like you're overly dominant in certain patterns, and that can include rotation, what we see often also is, is unilateral dominance, like significant or what I deem non-functional rotational yeah. strength left to right. If you have, you know, a glaring discrepancy or something that's like wildly, better than everything else, I think that's a recipe for disaster at the teeth line. Yeah. And I mean, to go off your point, like it's a system. So like systematically you have to kind of be good at these things um, because again, like sound like a broken record, everything else is going to be kind of like fucked up. And I think what we also have to look at is um, the diaphragm because the diaphragm also is going to attach to those things and yeah. the diaphragm going to act as like a kind of survival piece just because autonomically it helps us breathe and it's going to also act as like a regular skeletal muscle for stabilization so even with those um <clears throat> like t-spines that can't move you know when we assess their breathing or just like rib cage expansion that's where you get those flared ribs because maybe spine isn't really properly working so yeah no for sure mm. so Oh, I was just going to kind of add on to like the whole flared ribs thing. That's a big thing that we see in Olympic weightlifting as a way to try to find some activity within the T-spine. Yeah. So, you know, you'll see a lot of people when they try to go overhead, if that T-spine is locked and they're trying to get into that overhead snack position, their rib cage is just going to open right up to try to find something which is going to inevitably throw the bar off in some way, shape or form. And then same thing um, when you're looking at the, uh, the jerk overhead as well. So we really try to focus on not only like mobilizing 
the T-spine, but then making sure our athletes are aware about their rib cage and where it needs to be um, in order to remain stable overhead. Yeah. Um, no, that's all good shit. Uh, to close it out though, let's um, finish with some tangible pieces here. So for training considerations um, with regard to progression, regression, a couple of things to think on, uh, I would say first and foremost is constrained versus open. So uh, constrained meaning you're in a very rigid and fixed position. So think like uh, like down on your uh, down on your knees or in a quadru quadruped position, um, working T-spine extensions or rotations. When you're in a constrained position, you're going to isolate exactly what you're trying to get out of it. If you go to a more open or free flowing type of movement where it's more of just like maybe a lunge with a reach type of action, that's going to be what your body finds to be most optimal. So if you're somebody who has dysfunction, I would say that's not the right choice. If you're somebody who has good, you know, or, or normal, so to speak, function, um, I would say emphasize more of the um, open chain or the open free flowing. Secondly, being loaded versus assisted. So not just uh, looking at it as unloaded mobility, Jeremy, I know you're big on this, but when we say things like mobility, stretch, flexibility, like that shit's loaded. Cable exercises, band exercises, kettlebells, just because it's mobility doesn't mean it just has to be body weight and in some goofy position. We'll do a lot of um, barbell pullovers um, yeah. on a- um, Barbell pullovers are a great mobility. On a stability, a stability, blah, 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 on a stability ball. Um, or a Swiss ball and just being able to, you know, open up that way, get some load in there. Yep. And real quick, just to touch on like the neurological stuff. I mean, um, again, very still Falsoni here, but uh, your uh, sympathetic autonomic nervous system like kind of lives in your T-spine. So if your T-spine's all jacked up, I mean, you're going to be just kind of in this fight or flight situation this whole time. And a quick story. I mean, I just remember a patient in the past where, I literally just kind of over a couple appointments just mobilized the T spine. And then the next, you know, after that appointment, he's like, dude, I have like slept the best in months mm -hmm. after mobilizing that. So now we're taking them down like, you know, parasympathetically. And yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we obviously don't have time to get into the, the full depths of that. Maybe right. something we can kind of circle back to, but. Would you say that, and I don't want to go too far on this, would you say that somebody who has difficulty staying in one position when they sleep would probably be like a likely candidate to have some thoracic dysfunction? In a nutshell, no. Okay. And then it's very like multifactorial. Yeah, there's a lot going on there, but that's one thing that I have tried to kind of keep a tab on yeah with with my guys again because okay. that is like almost a 100 percent statement from everybody i work with that they okay. stay they, they can't be still when they sleep They're right always, you know moving or trying to reposition or whatever so anyhow um <laughs> to, to round back out here uh last thing to touch on is just the dynamic versus static nature of it so again if you're somebody who has instability or fragility at the, at the thoracic spine, you want to make sure that you're starting in a static base uh, position or movement, something that has minimal variables, minimal complexity to it so that you can really isolate. A lot of people make mistakes thinking that they're making T-spine movements and really it's either coming from the lumbar or the cervical or even the scapula. Um, so some keys to, on that are to make sure that your elbows are fully extended if you're doing something like the cat, cat camel. Um, if you're bending at the elbow, then we're getting movement from multiple areas. Um, and then, and then once you feel that you've gotten to that point to, uh, progress, you want to then look to add dyna a dynamic element to the movement and challenging it under speed conditions or tempo conditions. And then, you know, as Jeremy has, you know, hundreds of videos on, uh, perturbations and, and oscillatory type work where you're, you know, now challenging multiple systems, uh, concurrently at the same time but other than that anybody got anything to tack on to finish your spine's meant to move <laughs> yeah and on the road yeah yeah exactly